So we're looking at a response to Dale Ratzliff, and um, today we're going to look at part five, Jesus is my Sabbath. Now that, that sounds really great, doesn't it? When you really think about it, that sounds excellent. Jesus is my Sabbath. But the real issue is, is it biblical? That's the question. The text we're going to go to today is, today is found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And here's how the objection goes. Here's what the objection says. <clears throat> I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath because Jesus is my Sabbath. Now that's what people say. These are ex-Adventists saying this. Okay? So, it looks good on the surface. By the way, one lady came up to me the other day, and she knows a, a minister who is saying some of these very things, right? Well, where do you think he got it? Dale Ratzliff. A lot of ministers out there, a lot of preachers out there, are just flocking to get Dale stuff because you see he was an Adventist, right? So he left the church and now they're going to him to how to deal with Adventists. So when you're dealing with apologetics and that's what we're doing, why not go directly to the horse's mouth, right? And that's what we're doing. So this is the main thing that they're saying. I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath because Jesus is my Sabbath. Now take note. The purpose of this objection is to discredit the keeping of the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. Now based on what I've studied, I cannot defend from the Bible Dale Ratzliff's interpretations, assumptions, positions, and final conclusions. Now as I've said, is there anybody here today for the first time? Okay. Um, they've missed a whole lot, haven't they? Because we've covered a whole lot. Um, hopefully you'll be able to get the CDs and listen to it because we really have covered a lot. But the background of this is that today what we're going to do is we're going to answer this objection based upon three, what did I say, three major points. Now remember, they're saying, very simple, they're saying I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath because why? Jesus is my Sabbath. Now, i got to share a little story with you before we get started. A pastor friend of mine and I, we were in the seminary together, and he says I should do this. It was kind of a joke, but I said, you know, I'm going to write a book called What Theologians Don't Know. And, and he kind of snickered at that. What I'm going to share with you today is what Dale Ratzliff doesn't tell you. Okay? And you're going to see something very interesting of what he doesn't tell you. And when I get to that, you're going to see it clearly. But I'm going to start with three major points today. Number one, interpretation. Number one, interpretation. Number two, timing. Timing is very important. Timing. And number three, rest. Okay? So we're going to look at three major points Number one, interpretation. Number two, timing. And number three, rest. Now we're going to go to the text that they use. And right here it is. Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what? What does Jesus say? I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Okay? So we're going to look at interpretation. How are we to interpret, I will give you rest, and ye shall find rest unto your souls? Now, that's not a trick question. We want to know how to interpret it, right? Because we want the correct interpretation. We don't want to mislead people with a false interpretation. We want a correct interpretation of, I will give you rest, and you shall find rest under your, under your souls. Now, I'm going to give you Dale's interpretation. And then we're going to go into the Bible, okay? I'm going to give you Dale Ratzliff's interpretation. Now, here's what Dale Ratzliff says. Jesus is inviting the weary and heavy laden to come to him for what? True rest. Jesus is the center of rest for Christians. Now, by the way, 
It's very important to understand what he's saying. He goes on to say, while Old Covenant Israel experienced only, you see that word only? The rest of the fourth commandment, physical rest. Okay? Now, he shouldn't have said only, because we're going to see why. Remember when we started, we talked about what Jesus said, that by your own words you'll be justified, or by your own words you'll be condemned. <laughs> These words that they speak come back around and bite them, and they don't even realize it. He goes on to say, those who come to Jesus find true rest of soul. I believe that. Matter of fact, I believe what Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29 says. We just need to understand the correct interpretation. Now, read this carefully. <coughs> Is this really true? He says, only the rest of the fourth commandment is what? Physical rest. Now that goes totally contrary to the Bible. Why do I say that? Well, here's why. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is what? Spiritual. But watch this. You know what? When you read the Ten Commandments, what really indicates in those Ten Commandments that it's really spiritual? The Sabbath is holy. That's spiritual. That's not common. That's why when he rested the seventh day, he sanctified it, he made it holy, indicating it's not like the previous six days, which are common. Days permissible to work on. You see? It's spiritual. So to say only Israel's rest only in the fourth commandment is physical, that right there alone is not true, correct? Would we all agree to that? Okay. Now, he goes on to say, we find Jesus offering the true, what does he say? Sabbath rest. Now that's going to be interesting. He said, and by the way, Jesus does offer true Sabbath rest. You understand what I'm saying? See, there's where you get into confusion. Because it sounds right, there's things about it that's true. Jesus does offer true Sabbath rest. Correct? Absolutely. Christ gives the believer true rest of soul. Is that true? Yes, He does. Right? This is the better Sabbath rest for the Christian. Now, we're going to see how this works. He says this, Jesus is the true rest. Then he says, Christ is our Sabbath rest. Alright? Now let's look at this. Let's look at it carefully. Is the true interpretation of the words in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, I will give you rest and ye shall find rest unto your souls, mean Jesus is my Sabbath and Jesus is my rest to take the place of keeping the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment? No. Question. The answer, yes or no? no? You see what I'm saying? Now they're going to say what? Yes. They're going to say yes. That's the whole purpose of their point. Jesus is my Sabbath. I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath. Alright? So we're going to say no. And they're going to say yes. Does this Bible text, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, teach that we no longer have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment? Now you're qualifying, you're clarifying to get a specific answer, right? Yes or no? So you don't have to be confused. So in other words, let's say after this seminar you go home and next week you run into a person who's in this. And you ask the question. Remember what I said about you asking the question? You ask the question, does this Bible text in Matthew 11, 28, 29 teach that we no longer have to keep the literal day, seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment? They're going to say what? Yes. That's what they're going to say. By the way, once you get into to Matthew 11, 28 and 29, after today... They, which they associate Hebrews 4 with this. Hebrews chapter 4. Okay? And I want you to understand that because when they discover they can't get past this, how are they going to interpret Hebrews chapter 4? Okay? Alright. Now, to clarify this question, 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. We're going to clarify it. Number one, are we to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment? Question. Or are we to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment? Or not to keep it, I'm sorry. Or are we not to keep it? It's that decisive. Either yes or no. Either you do or you don't. Right? Okay. Now listen to this. According to these statements, if this is true, Jesus is my Sabbath, takes the place of keeping the actual literal Sabbath day, the fourth commandment, then of course there would be no need to keep any Sabbath day at all. Period. Correct? Because Jesus is that. Right? Why then do Sunday keepers say that Saturday is your Sabbath and Sunday is my Sabbath? If Jesus truly is the Sabbath, there would be no day attached to it. Correct? Yes or no? Would we agree to that? If Jesus is my Sabbath, took the place of keeping the literal Sabbath day, then there would be no Sabbath day period, no Saturday, no Sunday, no Sabbath day at all. Correct? So, to clarify that we clearly understand the objection before us and the interpretation by the objector, we will ask, can a person keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, in the Ten Commandments, and still rest in Jesus as their true Sabbath rest? You want them to answer that question. You want those people who believe that Jesus is their Sabbath, takes the place of the seventh day Sabbath, you want them to answer that question question. Now listen to what Land says, who, or Lind, who wrote in Del Ratzliff's book. Those who rely on the keeping of a literal Sabbath have missed the Sabbath that is ours, that is ours in Christ. So they're missing out too? No, no, because they believe Jesus is the Sabbath. Yeah, but they're going on Sunday, aren't they? Yeah, it doesn't matter to them. You see, the idea that Jesus is their Sabbath, they're just trying to counter Sabbath. That's all they're trying to do is counter Sabbath, okay? So here he's making it clear to the point that if we keep the literal seventh-day Sabbath, we've missed the Sabbath that's ours in Christ. That's what he's saying. So based on this interpretation, one who would keep the literal seventh-day Sabbath would miss the Sabbath in Christ. Is that true? Isn't that what they said? That's what they said. We don't agree with that. But we're just quoting what they're believing, right? You've got to know what somebody believes if you're going to counter it. That's why we want to clarify. That's why we want to ask these questions. Is this what you believe? Okay. Dale says this. In summary, Jesus is taking authority over Sabbath law. His presence. Underscore that. His presence. Very, very important point. His presence allows greater freedom... Regarding Sabbath observance, just as the priests were not bound by all the Sabbath laws in their temple services where God was present. Okay. Underscore presence. Okay. Very important. So, here's what I'm going to ask. So, are you saying that His presence allows greater freedom to disregard completely the keeping of the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment. He's going to say yes. You notice how I put the word what in there? Completely. If the answer is yes, then we will see that this interpretation is contrary to the Bible because the Sabbath was not disregarded completely because of God's presence. And if the answer is no, then that would mean that the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, would still be observed while at the same time God offers rest. Are we following that? There is one important point here that we want to point out and that is His presence didn't do away with the keeping of the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment. The priest's duties were still performed as instructed on the Sabbath day. Do we all understand what I'm saying here? Dale Ratzliff says the rest that Jesus offers is not the rest of the fourth commandment. Okay. I like this. 
I like what he says here. Because this right here gets him in trouble. Okay? You may not see it yet, but you will. To this I agree. This rest is different than the Sabbath. Interpretation. Dale Ratzliff. Here's what, how he interprets Matthew 11. I will give you rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. Okay? Ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus is our true rest. Now that's his interpretation. That's what he's thinking. Correct? That's what he's thinking. Now, Dale Ratzliff leaves some very important details out. Now I'm going to show you what he doesn't tell us. Okay? You know, it's not always what somebody says, but sometimes it's what they don't say. Y'all follow me? So we're going to see what he doesn't tell the readers of his book. He doesn't tell us that God himself says the same thing in the Old Testament. This was a shock. This is really a shock. You know why? Because in his books, in the very last part of the books, he gives all the text, reference text that he goes to in the entire book. And I'm going to show you text that he omits in these books. Never does he use these texts. So it's not only what they say or what text they use, look and see what they don't use. And there's a reason why they don't use those texts. Why? Because it would disprove their very interpretation. And we're going to see that today. Now remember, Jesus, or, uh, Ratzliff says that Jesus' presence makes the difference in this very thing. So let's look at it. Ratzliff completely omits Exodus. Now you want to write these two texts down. Very, very important text. Exodus chapter 33 verse 14. And again, take pictures if you want. You're welcome to anything we got here. Take pictures. And, uh, but Dale Ratzliff completely omits Exodus chapter 33 verse 14 and Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 in all of his books. By the way, before we even get to it, if you forget everything I say today, write these two texts down. And when you go to Matthew chapter 11 in your Bible, you know what I do in my Bible? I put these texts, I write them down right next to the verse in my Bible. I don't just write it on notes because you don't have those notes with you. Take these texts and put them right there by Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And guess what? When you go to that text, whether it's six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, you could go right to these two texts. Boom. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, for example, we're going to compare them. Look at this. Jesus says in the New Testament, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now watch. Remember, he emphasized his presence. Watch this. Old Testament. This is Jehovah who is God. This is Jehovah speaking. Got it? That's right. This is the, no, this is the this is Yahweh. This is Yahweh speaking. And he says this, and he said, "My what? Presence, Presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest." Same exact thing Jesus says in the New Testament. Identical. Now we're going to see something very important here. So, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, here's what Dale Rasliff doesn't tell you. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Not in his book. Got it? None of those books is it in. But that's a very relevant and important text when you say Yahweh is speaking about himself. And notice what the Bible says. Thus saith the who? Lord. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And guess what he says? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said we will not. Why? Because they hardened their hearts. That's what Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about. You see? So the rest of Hebrews chapter 4 is the same rest that Jesus is talking about here. Okay? Now watch this. Jehovah is saying, the Lord is saying, ye shall find rest. They're the ones that turned away from that. We will not walk therein. 
Okay? So who is the problem with? God or Israel? Israel. It's never the problem with God. <clears throat> so, does the Lord Jehovah, God, offer to them the same rest, Exodus 33, 14, Jeremiah 6, 16, that Jesus offers to us, Matthew 11, 28, and 29? You want them to answer that question. You want to raise this question. You got it? You see where I'm going? You want to be able to ask them this question. Because they're going to have to say yes or no. Why doesn't Dale Ratzeff inform his readers about the same thing mentioned in the Old Testament by God himself? So let's do the same principle of interpretation. I will give you rest. They interpret this, Ratzeff interprets this to mean Jesus is my Sabbath, correct? All right. Yahweh, Jehovah, saying, I will give thee rest. Why not interpret, the Lord is my Sabbath? The same thing. Shh, identical. It's God who's speaking. Y'all with me? Okay. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus is saying this. Jesus is our rest, so I don't have to keep the literal Sabbath, right? Now, why not interpret it the same phrase, the same way, when he says, Yahweh speaking, Jehovah, Lord, ye shall find rest for your souls. The Lord is our rest. Now, we're going to apply this principle to Israel. Picture yourself back in Israel's day. Because we have people today saying these things today, right? Picture yourself back in Israel's day. Are we to conclude that the same phrase, I will give you rest, and ye shall find rest for or unto your souls, means that they didn't have to keep the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, because the Lord was their Sabbath and rest? You see where I'm going with this, don't you? Picture with me, if you will, Moses comes down from Mount the mountain with the Ten Commandments. He stands before the multitude with the law written by God himself. The multitude sees the fourth commandment that says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Later, in Exodus 33, 14, they read, I will give you rest. Just like what Jesus said in the New Testament. The majority of the multitude begin to object. They begin to complain and argue with Moses. The Bible says in Exodus 33, 14, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. The multitude argues with Moses that this rest that the Lord God offers is different than the keeping of the fourth commandment, which it is, and we're going to see. Before we're finished today, we're going to see it is different. The multitude argues, the Lord God is my Sabbath. He is my Sabbath rest. I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath in the fourth commandment. Picture with me this argument, right? They reason that His presence allows them to disregard keeping the Sabbath. Why? Because they would say, God is my Sabbath. Are you all with me? Moses. Why are you putting us in bondage? Now you've heard that before, haven't you? You're trying to keep the Sabbath to work your way to heaven. Have you heard that before? Right? Picture Israel saying this to Moses, like we hear today. Moses, why are you so legalistic? Moses keeping the literal Sabbath day is legalism. Have you ever heard that before? They never say that about the other nine commandments. Have you ever heard anybody say that about the other nine commandments? You only hear legalism pop up when they're talking about what? The Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Moses, I am free from bondage and legalism. I am free in the Messiah that is to come. Remember, this is Israel. You see what I'm doing here, don't you? Right? God's presence, His rest sets me free. Now, how would Moses have responded to such objections? Because that's what we have to deal with today. Same thing, right? What if they would have done that? 
If Ratzliff's objection before us is the true interpretation of the phrase, I will give you rest, then certainly in Moses' day anyone could have argued the same thing. Yes or no? The point is, my presence and I will give you rest does not take the place of keeping the literal seventh day Sabbath. Didn't they continue to keep the seventh day Sabbath? Did God not offer them rest? We're going to see what that rest is. But rather reveals God's presence with us at any time, at any place, under any circumstances. Does the Lord God's presence with them in Exodus 33, 14 disregard keeping the Sabbath, the fourth commandment? Did it? If it did, that phrase should have done it then and there. Yes or no? Yes. Then and there. Exodus 33, 14 does not disregard keeping the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Couldn't the same exact argument have been used in the Old Testament against keeping the Sabbath? I'm, I'm going to throw one out here for you. I'm not going to cover that one today, but it's interesting. People say, you know, it doesn't matter what day you keep as long as you keep one day in seven. If that is the true interpretation, nobody would have ever been stoned to death for breaking the Sabbath. Because I tell you what, the first time they pick up stones to throw at me, I said, no, 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 wait a minute. My Sabbath's Tuesday. I don't want to be stoned to death. Would you want to be stoned to death? Right? But I'll tell you what, if I could choose any day in seven that I want to choose, and they're getting ready to stone me, you better believe I'd be saying, hey, today's not, no, 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 today's not my Sabbath. Thursday's my Sabbath. Right? Wouldn't that save you from being stoned to death? The fact is, it's not true. It's not biblical. The interpretation of the phrase, I will give you rest, would be no different in the Old Testament based on the fact that God Himself says the same thing that Jesus does in the New Testament. Dale says, I like this, listen to what he says, it only gets him in trouble. The more he says, the more you study into it, the more he, you realize it gets him in trouble. He says this, the one who was restoring Eden's rest, we find Jesus offering the true Sabbath rest. Is the one restoring Eden's rest Jesus? Yes or no? It is. It is. Jesus is the one that's restoring Eden's rest. Notice that Ratzliff calls Eden's rest what? The true Sabbath. The true Sabbath. Now you remember the other day when we covered where Ratzliff says the word Sabbath is not mentioned in the Genesis account? Now we find here he's referring to that Eden Sabbath and he calls it what? That Eden rest he calls what? The true Sabbath. So here he's got the word Sabbath associated with where? Creation. You see that? Remember, Dale Ratzliff says the rest that Jesus offers is not the rest of the fourth commandment. Now, here it is. Now this author plainly states that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is different and it is not the rest that Jesus offers in reference to the fourth commandment. To this I agree that it is different. But how is it different? Ratzliff doesn't say how it's different in his entire book. He doesn't say. It must also be pointed out that Jesus who is God. Yes or no? Yes, yes he is. Jesus, who is God, also gave the seventh day Sabbath commandment. Yes? yes? He did. This rest that Jesus offers was different in the Old Testament as well as different in the New Testament. Now, what I disagree, you ready for that? It's like what Paul Harvey used to say. Now the rest of the story, right? What I disagree with is... His interpretation teaches that this rest that is different does away with the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and therefore concludes that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is no longer to be kept. There's where we disagree. And I'm going to show you my point. These two distinct rests are in harmony with each other. Got it? 
not in opposition with each other, as Del Ratzliff would have us believe, but in harmony with each other. <clears throat> but as we have already seen from the Bible itself, that God the Lord said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest did not do away with the keeping of the literal seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment. If it would have, it would have done so then. Keeping the literal seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment truly deepens our relationship with our Creator in who we can truly rest. Amen? Amen. Nor does you shall find rest for your souls of Jeremiah 6.16 do away with the keeping of the literal Sabbath. Seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment, Exodus 28 through 11. If so, it should have done so then and there. Correct? This false interpretation of not keeping the literal seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment has completely removed the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. This is what they want us to believe. Yes or no? And like I said yesterday, don't call it the Ten Commandments if you believe it's nine. Don't argue to put the Ten Commandments on the public schools in the United States Supreme Court if you only mean nine of the commandments. That makes absolutely no sense. Dale says, remember what he says, the one who is restoring Eden's rest, we find Jesus offering the true Sabbath rest. Well, look at the paradigm. Dale is applying the word Sabbath to the rest in creation for Adam. Yes, Eden's rest the true Sabbath rest. Correct? That's what he's doing. So is the word Sabbath only associated with the Jews or the whole human race starting with Adam in creation as Eden's true Sabbath rest? Question. That's what you want to ask. Got it? Dale would have to admit that Sabbath was rooted in God's own character, the very moral character of God Himself. He would have to admit that if indeed he wants to say Eden's rest is truly the true Sabbath rest. Now remember, this was before the fall. Sin hadn't even come into the picture yet. The Sabbath was a sign from the beginning of creation and was rooted in God's own character. That's why when you know Dale used the word natural, naturally, what Israel was commanded to do, Adam and Eve did naturally, right there, in the heart. Adam created in God's image. When we keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, a memorial of God's creation, we truly are resting in our Creator. When people want to say, oh, you're trying to work your way to heaven to keep the Sabbath. And they'll say stuff like this. They'll say, um, you mean to tell me that if I don't keep the Sabbath, I'm going to go to hell? Have you ever heard people say that? I did a sermon one time called, Is God Particular? You know, the same could have been said of the trees in the garden there. The trees. You know, God said of all the trees you could freely eat, but this one, leave it alone. You know, Eve stole from God when she ate that fruit. It didn't belong to her. It belonged to God. He said, leave it alone. All these other trees. Now, did that affect the human race when she disobeyed God? Just over that tree. A tree's a tree. What's such a big deal about a tree? Right? Oh, there is a big deal, isn't there? Look at what happened to the human race. All because of disobedience, right? Dale's misleading interpretation has a false dichotomy between the literal seventh-day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, and the rest that Jesus, who is God himself, offers in the Old Testament, Exodus 33, 14, and Jeremiah 6, 16, and Matthew 11, 28, 29, also Hebrews chapter 4. So here's what it looks like. This is what Dale's teaching looks like. He says that Eden's rest was the true Sabbath rest. Right? So he would apply the word Sabbath in creation. Yes or no? Alright? Then he says that the Sabbath, the seventh day, literal Sabbath, the seventh day, was for the Jews only. That's what he says in his books. The nation of Israel, the children of Israel. The Jews only. 
Then Jesus comes along and Jesus says, I will give you rest. The one restoring God's rest, Eden's rest, the true Sabbath rest. That's what his paradigm looks like. Dale's misunderstanding this has led him and his followers to the wrong conclusion. The rest that Jesus offers is complementary of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, not contrary to the fourth commandment. Now we're going to go to the Bible this, to the Bible and you're going to see. Many have assumed, and probably correctly so, that Adam and Eve entered into God's rest on that first seventh day. So, did Adam and Eve keep the seventh day or not? Right? What about the following seventh day? And the one after that? And the next one after that? Was this Eden's rest given to all mankind or just Adam and Eve? Isn't that important to ask these kind of questions? It really is. Was this Eden's rest given for the benefit of mankind, the whole human race? So, there's what he says right there. So from Adam to Moses, they had no literal seventh day Sabbath. Because it was only for the Jews, he says. Was Eden's rest given to Cain and Abel, Seth, Abraham, etc., to all but not to Moses? Was Abraham offered this same rest that Adam entered into Eden's rest? We have already seen from the Bible that God did give rest to Moses, yes or no? Exodus 33, 14. And that rest was different than the seventh day Sabbath. Remember, he gave the literal seventh day Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20 to Moses. Was the rest God gave to Moses, Exodus 33, 14, Eden's rest? Watch what happens. Well, that's a good one. I see you kind of looking at that. I wish Dale would explain to his readers what rest God is giving to Moses in Exodus 33, 14 that he completely omits in his books. So the one restoring God's rest, Eden's rest, the true Sabbath rest, is Jesus. I will give you rest. Now, as Dale said, many have assumed, and probably correctly so, that Adam and Eve entered into God's rest on that first seventh day. So when did Adam and Eve stop keeping the seventh day? That's a very important question, yes? When man sinned, is what Ratzliff says. Now watch this. When man sinned, he was excluded from God's rest. <clears throat> That's what Dale Ratzliff says. <clears throat> Remember what he said? What Israel was commanded to do on the Sabbath would have been done naturally by Adam and Eve. Therefore, no command would have been needed. What Israel was commanded to do on the Sabbath would have been done naturally by Adam and Eve on the Sabbath. Therefore, no command would have been needed. <clears throat> For what purpose was Israel commanded to keep the seventh day Sabbath if Adam did keep the seventh day Sabbath naturally? Why was Israel not offered Eden's rest as Adam was? Question? On the other hand, if Israel was offered Eden's rest in Exodus 33, 14, should the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, have ended then and there when Eden's rest was so offered? It would make no sense to say that Adam did naturally what Israel was commanded to do on the Sabbath if the Sabbath didn't exist in creation. Israel was commanded to keep the seventh day, and that seventh day that they were commanded to keep was called what? <clears throat> it's simply amazing what great lengths people will go to only to find out their contradictions disprove the very point they are trying to prove. For example... There's no mention of the word Sabbath. And Dale calls the true Sabbath rest, Eden's rest. That's what he says. There's no mention of the word Sabbath in the book of Genesis, but its verb form is there. And we went through that, didn't we? Where does Dale get the idea to call this seventh day rest in creation Sabbath? He says the word Sabbath isn't even in Genesis. And yet he calls this seventh day Eden's rest, the true Sabbath rest that Jesus offers. Do you see that? Right. 
So the one who was restoring Eden's rest, the true Sabbath rest, God's rest in creation, Del Ratzliff calls Eden's rest the true Sabbath rest that Jesus was restoring. Okay. Now, let's look at it. He says, when man sinned, he was excluded from God's rest. Sinned. Excluded and God's rest. What is the definition of sin in the Bible? We talked about that, didn't we? What is the meaning of exclude? What does it imply? That at one point he had to have been included. Correct? What is the meaning of God's rest? See, again, you want to ask these questions. You want to ask them these questions. What is the meaning of God's rest? How then can it be said that ye shall find rest for your souls in Matthew eleven twenty nine? does away with the keeping of the literal seventh day Sabbath while not doing away with the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath in Jeremiah 6.16. Because when you read all through the book of Jeremiah, you read where Jeremiah is talking about the Sabbath. Jeremiah 17, you could read it all through the Bible. How could Dale say Old Covenant Israel experienced only the rest of the fourth commandment physical rest when Exodus 33.14 and Jeremiah 6.16 is speaking of the same rest of Matthew 11 verses 28 and 29. Now let's look at timing. We looked at interpretation. Now this one here is really going to be interesting. We're going to look at timing. When did Jesus become their Sabbath? That is a key question. If you forget everything else I say, when somebody says to you, they say, Eric, I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath because Jesus is my Sabbath. You ask, well when did Jesus become your Sabbath? You ask that question. When did Jesus become your Sabbath? Because we're going to talk about timing now. Okay? That's all you have to respond. Just simply ask the question. When did Jesus become your Sabbath? That's a good question. You're going to see why that's a good question. Notice what Jesus says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now friends, very important point here. Timing is very crucial. Jesus said this before he ever went to the cross. What did they say? Oh, though Jesus nailed the Sabbath to the cross. That's at the crucifixion. Jesus says this before he ever is crucified. Now watch what happens. At what point in time was it that they didn't need to keep the Sabbath any longer because Jesus was their Sabbath? In other words, just exactly when did Jesus become their Sabbath? Well, here it is. Here's the paradigm. Remember, Jesus died on the cross. Here's the crucifixion. Jesus said this very thing before He ever went to the cross. So certainly if it meant that the Sabbath ceased, the literal Sabbath, and Jesus became their Sabbath based on I will give you rest, it should have been here. Do we understand what I'm saying? Not at the cross. So you're asking the question, when did Jesus become their Sabbath? He went to the cross, at the cross, the crucifixion, after the cross at the resurrection, many years after the death of Jesus, now, those are very important questions. Why? Because you know what people say? They say, well, I keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. That's three days too late from the crucifixion. And the ratification of the covenant happened at the crucifixion, not the resurrection. Even when we take communion, Paul makes it very clear. We're to do this as often in remembrance of of His death and His coming. The resurrection is not even mentioned in that. His death and His coming. That's communion. Okay? So, you have to figure out, they're going to have to figure out where it is right here as to where Jesus became their Sabbath. And they're going to contradict themselves. Did Jesus become their Sabbath at the very point in time in which He said, I will give you rest? How would you as an audience interpret somebody standing before you today and says to you, I will give you rest? Right when? Right now. right now. 
Right now. What's that way in the Greek text? Right now. Right now. If you were asked to give a text from the Bible to show when Jesus became their Sabbath, what Bible text would you give? Book, chapter, and verse. Now remember, Dale says, and Paul Cardin says, they are Bible-believing Christians. We read it right out of their books when we first started this week, didn't we? Right out of their books. So, Bible-believing Christians should be able to produce exactly when it was that Jesus became their Sabbath. Book, chapter, and verse, if it's biblical. Right? Then and there, when Jesus said at Matthew 11, 28, and 29, is that when Jesus became their Sabbath, before He went to the cross? Number two, at the cross, at His crucifixion, when Jesus died, is that when Jesus became their Sabbath? Number three, at the resurrection, when Jesus arose from the grave, is that when Jesus became their Sabbath? Many years after the death of Jesus, is that when Jesus became their Sabbath? Get them to answer that question from the Bible. Do you see how relevant those questions are? To somebody say, oh, I don't have to keep the Sabbath. Jesus is my Sabbath. When did He become your Sabbath? Right there. When did Jesus become their Sabbath? A, before He went to the cross. B, at the cross, His crucifixion. C, after the resurrection. D, many years after the death of Jesus. He says, Ratzlaff says, Christ is our Sabbath rest. He says this in his book. I'm quoting his book. He's, he's got day of worship, then he's got seventh day history. And then shouldn't the very next parallel to that be Jesus is my Sabbath? Yes? Because he's replacing the literal seventh day Sabbath of history with Jesus is my Sabbath. Well, watch what he puts up there. He should have put that, shouldn't he? In his book. He should have put that, but he didn't put that. He put that. That's his book. Page 349. If Jesus was really replacing this as being the Sabbath, Jesus is my Sabbath, that's what should be in his book. Yes or no? But this is what he has in his book. And it's not true, is it? Dale Ratzlaff says the regular practice, here it is, that's why I mentioned all those questions. Dale Ratzlaff says the regular practice of Christian worship on Sunday came many years after the death of Christ. <laughs> That's what he says. That's what he says right there. So, when did Jesus become their Sabbath? Book, chapter, and verse in the Bible. Did it happen right there? Friends, you only have so many options. It's called, uh, what do you call it when you're taking an exam and uh, it's multiple choice? Wow, you only got so many options. That's it. You could guess, but you only have so many. And it's got to be in the context of right before the crucifixion, at the crucifixion, at the resurrection, or many years after. Yes or no? So we're covering our bases, right? When did it happen? Did it happen right there at the crucifixion? Did it happen there? When did Jesus become their Sabbath? Did it happen there? You see, we got a serious problem. Because that means if it happened here, then all this time before, nobody had Jesus as their Sabbath. True? If it happened here, that means from this point to here, nobody was their Sabbath till that happened. Jesus was not their Sabbath till that happened. Yes. That's right. Exactly, in Acts. That's right. Oh. Well, I wish we could give you this mic there, but yeah. He said that uh, the Paul was keeping the Sabbath in the 60s AD in the book of Acts. Well, you know what? It's both. The Greeks and the Jews. And it refers to that he's the Christ, the Messiah. So, we got a serious problem here, don't we? Would Dale Ratzlaff please kindly show us from the book, chapter, and verses in the Bible just where and when Jesus became our Sabbath?
Is that a fair question? Yes. Nothing trick question about that. That's an honest question. Had Jesus intended the meaning Jesus is my Sabbath, then why didn't Jesus himself just say so? You know what's interesting about Matthew 11? I'm saving the best for last. We haven't got there yet. How much easier it would have been for Jesus to have used the word Sabbath in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Jesus never used the word Sabbath. Remember what he said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Their assumption is that takes the place of Sabbath. That's their interpretation. But watch what Jesus is really saying. How much easier it would have been for Jesus to have used the word Sabbath instead of rest in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and simply have said, I am the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? You know, people say, I keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. You know what the Bible says? Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Certainly Jesus could have said, I am the Sabbath, right? If it was to do away with the fourth commandment. Correct? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Jesus could have said that, couldn't he? For I am the Sabbath. But since Jesus did not say it that way, which it never dawns on some, could hardly mean Jesus is my Sabbath the way they interpret this passage. Which brings me to my last point, and that is rest. Remember our three points? Interpretation, timing, and rest. To say that Jesus is my Sabbath is not what the Bible teaches. According to the Bible, Jesus is what? A person. The Sabbath day is referring to what? The day. Isn't that interesting? The day. You can rest in Jesus every moment of every day. Isn't that good news? And we're going to go to Bible text for that. But to keep the Sabbath is the seventh day. Isn't that what the Bible says? according to the Bible, in what? Corporate worship. You see, there are people who say, well, you know, we should keep every day holy. We should worship God every day. That's true. But that's individual worship. The Sabbath refers to corporate worship. All believers. To prove that point, read Isaiah chapter 66. New heaven, new earth. All flesh will come to worship before me, saith the Lord. From Sabbath to Sabbath. That's corporate worship. That's totally different than individual worship. That's corporate worship. Okay? But where does Jesus say, I am the Sabbath day? Jesus doesn't say that. After having read the Bible carefully, and the I am, all the I am statements of Jesus, certainly Jesus could have said very simply, I am the Sabbath. Verbally, if that is truly what he intended to mean. Could it be that the objectors have a misconception and false interpretation about what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 and 29? Jesus doesn't even mention the word Sabbath in Matthew 11 28, but rather a word that means refreshed. Refreshed. Now we're going to follow this through in the Bible. We're going to see how this works. God gave us the Ten Commandments that define sin. Ratzliff has changed the Ten Commandments to mean that only nine commandments define sin. Now friends, what God Himself does, don't mess with it. Leave it just like it is. Don't touch it. So we're going to investigate this rest in our conclusion. The meaning of this word for rest is refreshed. When looking carefully at the words used in the New Testament and Old Testament of Matthew 11, 28 and 29, we discover the idea of peace. Have you ever been in the midst of a storm and God gives you peace? Now I tell you friends, when I was in the Navy, I've been in a hurricane on an aircraft carrier and I tell you, it's no pretty picture. And I tell you what, to have peace during a time of storm, that's the kind of rest we're going to talk about. 
So in looking carefully at these words, we discover the idea of peace and refreshing or that of giving us the assurance of our faith and trust in God no matter what the circumstances are in our daily life. I want peace. Do you want peace? I will give you rest. This is what Jesus says, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Some time ago I was called to help those who had been hit by a tornado. We gave them help. We helped them during a hard time in their life. We gave them rest from doing what they could not do themselves. Yes? This is exactly what Jesus does. He gives us rest from the labors and weariness of this life that we cannot do for ourselves. In other words, it's out of our control. We depend upon Jesus. And you know what? Everybody here could look back at different turning points in their lives where they didn't know how they were going to make it through that situation. And they look back and they see where God was there. Yes? Every one of us could experience that. Whether we realized it at that time or not, later we realized, yes, God was there. But now, listen to this. 1 Kings 5.4 But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. Now he's not talking about the Sabbath rest, seventh day. He's talking about the rest that Moses experienced in the hard times he was going through. He was talking about the rest that the children of Israel was experiencing by being in Egyptian bondage. Is not the Lord your God with you? You know the story of the footprints in the sand? And hath He not given you rest on every side? When it seems like everything's against you, the whole world's crashing down on you, and there's God with you. Right there in the midst of it. To, listen to this. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself. The Bible is full of this kind of rest that God is offering us. But you know what? Many times our prayers only happen when we're in dry, dire straits. But prior to that, our prayers didn't get higher in the ceiling, right? Because we wasn't trusting in the Lord to work the situation out. We do everything we can to make it right, to make it work, to make it happen, and we fail, don't we? God never fails. This is the kind of rest God is talking about. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Isaiah 28, verse 12, Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 12. Can you see the kind of rest that God is speaking about here? Trust him, no matter what happens. Even if you die. Got it? You trust in the Lord. He giveth you rest from all your enemies round about so that ye dwell in safety. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 10. Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest. By the way, did you know that the Hebrew word for Noah, the ark, that was a haven of rest during the flood. Noah's name in Hebrew means rest. That's exactly what his name means in Hebrew. Rest. And he was in a safe place, wasn't he? Behold, there it is right there. And I, this is Chronicles, 1 Chronicles. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. Isn't that interesting? For David said, The Lord God of Israel hath given rest unto his people. This is the kind of rest he wants to give us. To trust him through whatever is happening in our life. Now listen to the opposite of the wicked here. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow. Hey, there's people here that's lost loved ones. We hurt when we lose loved ones. 
We sorrow. It hurts. What does the Lord say? The Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. That's good news, isn't it? This is what Jesus is offering. This is the rest that God offered Moses in Exodus chapter 33, 14. It is a different rest. It's trusting Him. But when we keep the Sabbath, the seven-day Sabbath, that only exemplifies and magnifies the very rest that God gives us. You see? Listen to this. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul find rest in who? God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. And the Bible tells us in the New Testament that Jesus is the rock that went with Moses. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Jesus was the rock. He was the pillar. He was with Moses at Mount Sinai. Jesus was. Trust in Him sometimes. Trust in Him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts to Him. He wants your heart. You know, a lot of people is going to miss heaven by this much. Yes? By this much. You could have head knowledge without Jesus. Pour out your hearts to Him. For God is our refuge. Does it matter to God how we interpret the Bible? It does, doesn't it? Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subver subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Friends, we want to rightly divide the word of truth, don't we? We don't want to mislead anybody. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Searching for truth. Keep on keeping on. You know, knowledge is a paradox. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. You can't exhaust the Bible, friends. Some people feel that, you know, especially when we do evangelistic meetings, I hear it all the time. Oh, we've tried that. We've done that, you know. It's, oh, I, why didn't the church people come to the meetings? Oh, I've heard that for the last 30 years. Friends, I want to tell you something. I've been pastoring for now about 27, 28 years, and I don't want to miss that stuff because there's always something somebody brings up that you have not heard before. Amen. And that something is very, very important. Very relevant. When you have the opportunity, don't miss it. You really don't. The key is a love of the truth as it is in Jesus. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Dale Ratzlaff's books are false and misleading. That's exactly what's happened. And we've seen that in this seminar this week, haven't we? So when people try to to, and I use the word buffalo you, ask some of these questions. Ask the question. You want clarification. You want them to say yes on these things because then you're going to turn right around and say, oh, but what about this? When did Jesus become their Sabbath? Write that down in bold black. When did Jesus become their Sabbath? Before He went to the cross, at the cross, at the resurrection, many years later, when did Jesus become your Sabbath? Dale Ratzlaff is not being true with the evidence from the Bible. He has left out many important Bible texts and many important details. That's exactly what he's done. Now, if you think that Dale Ratzlaff is right, then just answer my question from the Bible. Here it is. How are we to interpret, I will give you rest, and ye shall find rest for your souls? Ask that question. How do you interpret that? Why do you not mention Exodus 33, 14 and Jeremiah 6, 16? That's why you need to put those texts right there at Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 11. Right there. In your Bible. 
When did Jesus become your Sabbath? Book, chapter, and verse in the Bible. Is the true interpretation of the words, I will give you rest and ye shall find rest unto your souls, mean Jesus is my Sabbath and Jesus is my rest for this reason. I do not have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, that the fourth commandment, because Jesus is the rest in Matthew 11, 28, 29. There are other reasons the Bible text that people use for not keeping the Sabbath. I actually call those excuses because that's what they are. And I even add the word pretend excuses. Because all they are is diversion tactics of Satan. That's it. To derail people, throw people off. So there are other reasons in Bible text that people use for not keeping the Sabbath and we will in other presentations. Of course, that'll have to be another year. Would you come back next time, next year, for another presentation if I did it on different parts of this? Maybe deal with some of those like every day is holy and... Okay. Can a person keep the literal seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment and the ten commandments and still rest in Jesus as their true rest? Are you saying that His presence allows greater freedom to disregard completely? Remember that word completely is important. The keeping of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. Why doesn't Dale inform his readers about the same thing mentioned in the Old Testament by God Himself? Because I'll tell you why. When he first did this, I don't think he realized that. I don't think he realized that. That this is in the Old Testament. Mentioned by God Himself. Are we to conclude that the same phrase in the Old Testament said by God Himself, I will give you rest, means that they didn't have to keep the seventh day Sabbath because the Lord was their Sabbath. Does the Lord God's presence with them in Exodus 33, 14 disregard keeping the Sabbath for commandment? Couldn't the same exact argument have been used in the Old Testament against keeping the Sabbath? So, it would be nice if our Jesus is our Sabbath only people would answer these questions from the Bible. Conclusion again. By the way, Paul was a long-winded preacher. He preached until midnight on the first day, so I got another conclusion, just short, to give you the true interpretation. The rest that Jesus offers in Matthew 11, 28, 29 does not disregard or annul the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments any more than the same rest disregards the Sabbath in Exodus 33, 14 and Jeremiah 6, 16. So here's the true interpretation versus the false. True interpretation. Matthew 11:28 does not teach that the rest that Jesus offers takes the place of the seventh day Sabbath in the Ten Commandments. False interpretation. Jesus is my Sabbath. I don't have to keep the literal seventh day Sabbath. True interpretation. The rest in Matthew 11:28 is congruent. You know what the word congruent means? It means running at the same time with the seventh day Sabbath in the fourth commandment rather than replace or oppose the seventh day Sabbath. Have I made myself clear today? Anybody confused? Everybody understood clearly what I said today? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've spent together. The week has gone by so fast, Lord, and and we just pray that um, maybe later on we could continue this type of study, that we could get a better understanding. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with each and every one here, that they may continue to enjoy camp meeting, draw closer to you. And we thank you, Father, for your wonderful love and grace. In Jesus' precious name we pray through your Holy Spirit. Amen.